this is my 10th holiday season as an intermittent faster. And you know what I didn't mention before that is I lost 80 pounds with intermittent fasting and I've kept it off the whole time. Welcome to the show where we help you make smart nutrition simple. If you want proven nutrition strategies to help you build a better body and create the energy to show up for your family without overly restrictive and unrealistic dieting, then you're in the right place. Make sure to subscribe and enjoy this episode. Could intermittent fasting be the key to sustainable weight loss? My next guest, elementary school teacher turned best-selling author Jin Stevens thinks so. In 2014, Jin was obese, felt like crap, and hated the person she saw in the mirror. She had spent years yo-yo dieting only to lose and regain the same weight back, and then some. And desperate to find a solution, she turned to intermittent fasting. Since then, Jin has lost more than 80 pounds and kept it off. In today's conversation, we take a deep dive into the world of intermittent fasting and all of the physiological benefits. We talk about why intermittent fasting is easier to implement than other types of dieting protocols, the concept of metabolic flexibility, the importance of setting realistic expectations when it comes to fat loss, some of the biggest mistakes that people make with intermittent fasting, as well as how to get started with your own intermittent fasting journey. So if any of this information in our conversation today resonates with you, then make sure to check out Jin's books, Fast, Feast, Repeat, as well as Clean-ish, Delay, Don't Deny, and her upcoming book, 28 Day Fast Start Day by Day. All of the links are in the show notes below. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Jin Stevens. Jen Stevens, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. What's going on? Well, thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here today. It's a pleasure having you. I'm excited. I've talked about intermittent fasting on the show before. Um, I've had a couple experts uh, and researchers in intermittent fasting before. It's a, it's, a, it's a topic and a conversation that I think is so salient and relevant to our dieting sphere to weight loss, to the time of year that we're going into, you know, we're going into the new year, starts all the new year's resolutions and like, what are people going to do? What diet are they going to be on? So like super timely right now for us to dive in. So thanks for being here. Awesome. This is my 10th holiday season as an intermittent faster. Number amazing. 10. I did that amazing. That just feels like quite a milestone. Listen, like you're an expert in this field. You have, um, you know, multiple books, you have a New York Times and a USA Today bestseller. One of the things I appreciate about um, your book, Fast Feast Repeat, is how um, referenced it -hmm. is. So you obviously did your homework. It wasn't just a kind of weekend write up throwing on Amazon to say you're a published (laughs) author. Clearly, there was a tremendous amount of work and time and energy and research that went into it. So you know, you're clearly an expert in the field, which is why I'm, I love having the opportunity to share your knowledge and wisdom with our community. What is it about intermittent fasting that you think is so particularly special uh, for people to understand? Well, the thing about um, intermittent fasting is that it is really a lifestyle that you can start today and like I said, this is my 10th holiday season as an intermittent faster. And you know what I didn't mention before that is I lost 80 pounds with intermittent fasting and I've kept it off the whole time, right? Like I just had to buy some new jeans, not because I needed a new size, but because my old ones were starting to look ratty. <laughs> did you go into learning about intermittent fasting or leveraging intermittent fasting as a weight loss tool originally? Oh yeah. Oh, I was obese. I mean, 80 pounds heavier than I am now. I was literally obese. And You know, dieting was my hobby, which sounds crazy, (laughs) but anybody who has ever struggled with obesity, or even if you haven't, just, you know, people who have been really, you know, focused on not wanting to gain weight, you know, you may think of dieting as your hobby. And it really Mm. kind of became like that for me because all those years that I struggled, you know, I, I yo-yoed, I went up and down, up and down. And, you know, it wasn't until 2014 when I was like, realized I am obese and I've got to do something. You know, I had like literally been doing everything. I read everything about diet, weight loss, 
everything. I actually dabbled in intermittent fasting from 2009 to 2014. So I had even dabbled in it before, but, but I didn't understand it at all. I just thought it was like a way to eat fewer calories, right? In an eating window. Now we know it's so much more than that. But I was really desperate in 2014 when, you know, I was 210 pounds and saw myself in pictures and couldn't believe that right. was me. And I was like, I've got to do something. Well, you know, I had a doctorate by that point in gifted education. I have a master's in natural sciences. I was a teacher. And I was very successful teaching online, teaching adults, teaching gifted endorsement classes for our county. And I could not lose weight and keep it off. I could crash diet my way down. I would gain it all back plus more. I could well, is that, diet. do you think, it, hmm? you know, the the ways in which you were losing it on, obviously we'll get into that, but what do you think about all the different ways that you tried? What was it about those that was unrealistic for you? Well, they're all fighting against how your body works. And that is what really, you know, once I finally understood you know, the magic of intermittent fasting and how it helps us beyond just we are eating fewer calories or, or whatever, when I really understood the idea of metabolic flexibility and you know, really tapping into our fat stores, the role of insulin, high levels of insulin, keeping us from, from burning stored fat, suddenly I understood why all, why all the diets I'd tried over the years didn't work. And you know, I talk about this in the introduction to, to Fast, Feast, Repeat. Yep. You know, we've got research, you know, the Biggest Loser Study. Your listeners have probably heard of that. The Minnesota because, Starvation Studies. The, yep, the Minnesota yep. Starvation Experiment. We know that when you just, you know, restrict your calories into a typical low-calorie diet, like we've all been told to do, eating multiple small meals a day, our body tries to protect us and it downregulates our metabolism. It sends us eat more signal so that we're really, really hungry. And, you know, eventually we just can't do it anymore and we quit. You know, mm -hmm. there's a saying that um, I did not create this saying, but I love it. It's um, diets are easy in contemplation, but hard in execution. You know, we think about the diet we're going to start on Monday, the diet we're going to yeah. start next week. That it's going to be so easy. We know what we're going to do. We're going to do it. But then when we do it, it gets harder and harder over time. Well, the flip side of that is intermittent fasting is hard in contemplation, but easy in execution. You're like, oh my God, I'm going to fast. It's going to be so hard. But once your, your body becomes metabolically flexible and you're fat adapted, you're used to it, it's like the easiest thing you'll ever do. So understanding the physical changes that have to go on when you're doing intermittent fasting and giving your body time to adapt, and then realizing that it's a lifestyle. And you never have to look for that New Year's diet or that new diet plan again. You know, I tried them all, literally. I would go to Amazon, and I would look at the diet category and see what's new, what's out there. And I would read the reviews, and I would read what it's about. And, you know, I tried all the ones where you like, eat this food or don't eat that food. And, you right. know, count this, count that. And, you know, you can only do that for so long before either you're like sick of restricting or sick of eating whatever it was that you had to eat or sick of counting. And then you quit and your body fights back and then you gain all the way back plus more. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, what we know about dieting culture and all of the, right. the fad diets out there is they truly do go against everything uh, against human physiology and against human psychology. And it's yes. one thing to be able to implement the diet and aggressively lose weight as you experience probably many, many, many oh, times, yeah. right? And then it's a whole nother level of the metabolic pushback that we experience mm -hmm. to say nothing of the psychological challenges involved in uh, the all or nothing thinking of, you know, what can I eat and what can't I eat, right? What are the good and the bad? Uh, and the whole dichotomous thinking around diet culture, which, you know, we talk a lot about because truly you and I can probably agree. It's one of the biggest limiting factors yeah. to why people are not successful is if they feel like there's an overt level of restriction. And so I, I definitely can see the value of, you know, at least as the title implies fast feast repeat. Let's jump into that in a minute, but before we do, let's just, you know, from a, a definition standpoint, just so we're all on the same page, like in your interpretation and in your definition, like what is intermittent fasting? All right. Well, I'll, I'm super happy to talk about that. I did not invent any of the protocols for intermittent fasting. I want to make that very, very clear. I'm a teacher. I taught elementary school for 28 years. 
So when I wrote or when I when I actually started sharing intermittent fasting with people, um, you know, I started a Facebook group in 2015. I wrote my first book in 2016. I've been sharing it ever since as a teacher. So I have gathered literally everything, all the different protocols, all the different ways of doing it and and put it together. And I've redelivered it like a teacher would. So we've got basically two main styles of intermittent, what we would call intermittent fasting. And one of them is time-restricted eating. And people have heard of that probably through the, the, the wording eating window, or you have like a fasting length and then an eating window time. 16-8 is one people hear of a lot versus, Perfect. you know, there's really, it just it adds up to 24, 19. So five. in that particular case, we would fast for 16 hours yep. as an example. It's like we have our last meal at 6 p.m. and we fast for 16 hours. We don't eat again until noon right. the next day. Right. So that would be 16 hours fasting, eight hour eating right. window. Exactly. Um, so time restricted eating is probably what most people think of when they hear the terminology um, intermittent fasting at this point. But we've also got you know the alternate daily fasting approaches. Sure. Um, people may have heard it called 5-2. That was really popular, especially in the UK, um, because a, a famous doctor over there did a documentary about it and wrote some books about it. 5-2 is an alternate daily fasting protocol. There are other books that have been written on that subject, you know, the every other day diet, alternate day fasting. But that has to do with um, where you're like, maybe you could think of it as like 36-12, honestly, if you're thinking about that whole, you know. Sure. fasting, eating. So it would be like 36 hours of fasting and then 12 hours of eating. And that protocol sounds really hard. We would not start with that it one. You're like, hard. oh my God, I'm going to fast for 36 hours. But <laughs> I don't actually do alternate day fasting at this point, although I have done it before. But there are many therapeutic reasons why you might choose it. Like if, if someone has been doing um, low calorie dieting for a really long time or taking diet drugs of some sort and their metabolic rate has slowed, Alternate day fasting is really great for the metabolic boost. We have, you know, the that 12-hour period, we call that the up day. And um, that is a really great metabolic boosting day. So you have your 36 hours of fasting, which is great for fat burning. And then you have a 12-hour um, eating period, mm -hmm. which boosts your metabolic rate. So you have that balance. Alternate day fasting is very well researched. And um, they found that following that type of protocol is great for you know, keeping your metabolic rate from crashing while still losing the fat. You know, it's really the people who have like a consistent day to day, low, 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 you know, intake yeah, well, of food. That's you know, when you adapt. You so that's interesting, and and I think that's worth diving into here because you mentioned metabolic flexibility, right. and you know, I, I've heard you speak, and and it's you know referenced in your book is is it's not necessarily about weight loss, and, and you know. From a calorie standpoint, there's nothing necessarily better about intermittent fasting than controlling your calories, not intermittent fasting and eating consistently every day. But seems like there's a bunch uh, of physiological and metabolic benefits. So maybe you could speak to this level of metabolic flexibility. Like, what does that mean? Um, and how could people be thinking about it as to the advantages of intermittent fasting? Yep. And I mean, there may be some benefits to fasting when it comes to, you know, calories, honestly, just because, you know, we've got some, some limited research on, you know, metabolic rate and fasting. And they showed how like there was one study where they did the people who were not typically doing intermittent fasting and they had them do a 72 hour fast and they measured all sorts of things during that time. But they found that their metabolic rate actually went up during the first part of the fast. And then when they got to, I know 36 hours a little after that, as we started to go in time, it started to come back down again. Yeah, you've so got a graph the, in the uh yeah. in the book. By the time they got to 72 hours, metabolic rate was still slightly higher than it had been at baseline, but it was on that downward trajectory. So there might be some, you know, some metabolic boosting of you know that fat burning state when you're when you're fasting. That being said, those were not people who are regularly fasting. That was just like an isolated mm -hmm. 72 hour fast. But as far as metabolic flexibility goes, we are all born metabolically flexible. And, you know, we're we are designed to be able to shift our fuel sources as needed. When you're eating food, there's your fuel source. When you're not eating, we've all got lots of fuel stored right. in and on our bodies, whether it's you know, glycogen in our liver, glycogen in our muscles. We also have fat on our bodies. And when you're eating a typical low-calorie diet where you're eating multiple times during the day, 
you are really solidly in the state of running on what you're putting in. Your body doesn't want to go looking for your fat because that takes a lot more effort. So you're just basically on that blood sugar roller coaster all day long. You wake Especially up. Especially when we're feeding ourselves yeah. consistently snacking throughout yeah. the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You eat that breakfast because, you know, we're told, I remember some diet book I read was like, you must eat breakfast within 30 minutes if your feet hitting the floor. I mean, literally, or you're going to like, I don't know what would happen. Your muscles will liquefy. You're going right. to, I don't know. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, I used to do that. And then you're, you got your fuel coming in from that. And then when your blood sugar starts to go back down, you're like, well, now I'm hungry again. So you keep eating. So you're just like, I was eating breakfast, snack, a latte, lunch, another snack, another latte. Now it's dinner. Now it's an after dinner snack. I mean, it was just literally coming in, coming in, coming in. And so because whenever we eat or drink certain things, our body releases insulin in response. Insulin is a storage hormone. So when we're doing that all day long, we're in storage mode, storage mode, storage mode. And it requires to to really tap into our fat stores. And we need to have lower levels of insulin so that our body can, oh, well, look at all that fat we've got on hand. Let's let's use some of that for fuel. Burn more body fat. Yeah. Exactly. So when we're um when we're in the traditional paradigm of eating all the time, we just have a hard time tapping into our fat stores for fuel. We get really, really hangry. Well, with intermittent fasting, when you're fasting clean, you lower your insulin, your body's like, okay, we're doing something different now. And you're like, where's the, where's the fuel? And your body has to look around and say, oh, we've got some fuel already. It's going to use first that glycogen that it can get to from your liver. But then eventually your body will say, you know what? Now I can see all the fat. We got some fat. And so then your body will tap into those fat stores just as nature intended because that's why we've stored it. So once your body has adapted like that, you're once again, metabolically flexible. I mean, that's how man was supposed to be. You know, we did not have access to fuel or, you know, going to the grocery store or driving through a Starbucks. People ate when they could get food. And so people were able to switch fuel sources. Our bodies are designed to effortlessly go back and forth. But over our lifetime of frequent snacking and eating, we lose that metabolic flexibility, but we can get it back. Yeah. So what I'm hearing there is, you know, similar to how our ancestors would have um, evolved is we go through periods of feast and famine. And there were times where we would have access to plenty of calories. and probably plenty of times where we wouldn't have access to calories. And the beautiful thing about the body and this homeostasis, right? This, our body's ability to maintain normalcy uh, is that we can shift through fuel sources to the degree that when we find the beehive and the honey, that we can take in all those carbohydrates and 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 utilize those calories and, and glycogen in the muscles and the liver for fuel. But similarly, when we don't have exposure to those, we have body fat stores to be able to leverage and burn as fuel. And because of modern day eating practices, because of eating too many calories, eating too consistently throughout the day, um, eating too much sugar uh, too consistently, then we lose our body's ability to bounce back and forth, this inherent level of flexibility, right? Right. Um, Mm -hmm. which we really need. And I think what we're realizing now in terms of metabolic health is we're seeing the implications of this lack of metabolic flexibility with poor glucose management. So poor blood sugar management with insulin resistance, right? With stubborn body fat, uh, with uh, levels of leptin and ghrelin that are out uh, out of regulation, so to speak. And that seems to me where when we can start to establish that me- metabolic flexibility and intermittent fasting being a way to help us start to do that, then it can be extremely beneficial from a metabolism standpoint. Is that fair? Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's what, you know why I talked about at the beginning, how it's, you know, it's hard in contemplation, but easy in execution. That's why it becomes easy. You know, obviously the first, when your body is adapting, you know, we, we call it the 28 day fast start and you know, you've got to give your body time. So we just think average of about four weeks to adapt, although some bodies adapt faster and some take longer, depending on how healthy you are and how metabolically healthy you are when you begin. But once your body flips that metabolic switch, you just, 
it, you don't have that that struggle. You, I mean, you might have a wave of hunger, like for me. Um, I recently have been wearing a CGM here and there. I bet you've worn a CGM before. I cer- I certainly have. Yes, I, I've had a feeling that you had. But it's so cool to watch it on my CGM. Like I'll wake up and I drink my coffee. My blood sugars in you know a certain range, and then when I get to about hour. 16 of my fats. I, I do a loose 19.5. That's kind of what I do. That's that's um, what works really well for me and feels like a lifestyle. But when I get to right around hour 16, I feel like a little mild hunger wave. And I noticed that was right when my CGM was really getting down to like the lower, like lower normal blood sugar, like 72, whatever. Yeah. And then after that initial little like, ooh, you could eat. My body's like, all right, you're not going to eat. So my blood sugar stays really steady right there in that range until I open my window. I don't just keep getting hungrier and hungrier until I die or something. I don't get lightheaded. My blood sugar doesn't crash. But it's like my body is like, sends me that little hunger signal like you could eat, but then I don't. So then it flips that metabolic switch and then I'm good to go till I open my window. Yeah, and you've learned to regulate that, or your and, yeah. and and understand your body more, and you can leverage some of those tools and data to make informed decisions, which I'm a huge proponent of, within reason, right? right. For for when you're ready for it, and you can interpret it the right way. But I love you how know, you said that because you're <laughs> right because they can really, you know, CGM, it can really also confuse you. <laughs> well, it's the same with weighing yourself every day, yeah. and by the way, like we do recommend our clients weigh themselves every day. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know how to interpret the data, it can really throw you for a loop. And that's one of the things about dieting in general is is the psychology of this process. And now let's talk about kind of the ways to implement intermittent fasting in a way that's realistic for most people. Obviously, you had exposure to hundreds of thousands of people. You have thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in your community. Um, and so you've had a lot of experience hearing from people. Uh, in fact, I think you even have a whole podcast on just your your clients' experiences with intermittent fasting. Is that right? Well, I do. It's intermittent fasting stories. And what's funny is they're not like they're not my clients in the way that you would think of. Like um, it's just it's people. I mean, I guess they've read my books, they've right. read my podcast. It's just like people who are listening to the podcast. And then they just send me an email and say, I'd like to come on your podcast. I'm like, come on. And I interview them and they tell their experiences that intermittent fasting stories. I've recorded kind of 380 something, I guess, episodes of that now. That's awesome. And it is. And these, these are not people I worked with one-on-one. These are, some of them are in my community as well, but they're often just people I've never even met until we sit down and talk on that, um, on that episode. And they tell me their story. And yeah, it, it is such a life-changing way of living. I mean, this podcast is called The Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. And yeah. and and we're all about helping people infuse easily applicable tools around dieting and exercise and you know, nutrition and lifestyle and mindset. And so when it comes to intermittent fasting, I'm sure a lot of people listening have tried intermittent fasting. Maybe they went right to 16-8. Maybe they started with a 24-hour fast. Maybe they tried to do something more aggressive. And one of the things I appreciate about your approach is you make it very clear that there's no one right way to do this. It, it truly is this kind of fundamental learning curve, which I speak to all of the time. But right out of the gate is your sort of giving people permission to kind of figure out what's going to work best for them so that like, what's the worst part about dieting in general is if you don't follow the protocol, you failed. And it's like, oh, well, I already blew it. So might as well start again Monday or I just screw it. I'll you know wait until the next diet and you'll be searching Amazon. So with intermittent fasting in general, what have you observed to be the best ways for people to get started? That's a great question. And again, I really think my background as an elementary teacher has helped me in in, presenting health information, which might sound crazy. But, you know, in the in the classroom, we talk about differentiation, right? Every child doesn't need the same. We don't all have the same learning styles. We we learn differently. We have different preferences. And the same is true with literally everything. We're also very different. We have bio individuality. We have different circadian rhythms. I am a morning person, not a night person. My husband is the opposite. So 
there is literally no one size fits all anything. And, and that's the, the thing about intermittent fasting as well. You know, people will say, oh, wait, just tell me what to do. Tell me the best. When is the mm. best time to have my eating window? Which is the best approach for me? And it's, it's not like that at all. You know, you, I like the way you talked about, you know, intermittent fasting as a tool, right? It's a tool and a healthy weight loss journey. Well, when you're in intermittent fasting itself, we have a lot of tools within that toolbox as well. You know, so why do people struggle with intermittent fasting and, and making it a lifestyle? Sometimes, you know, if it's so great, why would anybody start it and stop it? Why would they quit? Mm. And it's because, you know, there, there are many, many reasons for that. One of them, you probably face this with, with your clients and the people that you work with. And that is unrealistic expectations. Do you ever see that as a problem? Always. It's always. One of the biggest. You know, I was just standing at the checkout counter this week of the grocery store. You know, those magazines that make all the claims about weight loss on the cover. The one that was on there this week literally said, lose three pounds a day. (laughs) (laughs) I was telling my friend about that. She's like, is this an amputation program? I mean, because you're not. You cannot lose three pounds of fat a day. Now, my my dad was just in the hospital. He had a lot of fluid buildup. He has kidney disease. He lost 40 pounds in two days, right? It was fluid because they gave him drugs for that, but he did not lose 40 pounds of fat. We cannot lose weight that quickly when when we can't lose fat that quickly. So people will start intermittent fasting and they're looking for you know, grocery store checkout headline rates of weight loss. You're not going to lose 50 pounds by New Year's Day. You're not, right. you're just not going to do it unless you have a medical condition, you release a lot of fluid and, you know, a lot of inflammation. You can release a lot of fluid quickly, but you can't lose fat quickly. So understanding that actual fat loss is really, really slow. Yes. And that fat loss can be masked by fluid retention food in your system. If you're working out, Muscle your gains. muscles are, yes. have inflammation. You're going to, well, you just started lifting weights. Now you're up five pounds. Did I just put on five pounds of muscle? No, you. Right. <laughs> it's fluid retention. So understanding that you're not going to have dramatic, quick weight loss, no matter what, if you're doing it in a healthy way, it's going to be slow and steady. I think that's one of the, the biggest things So you, you probably, like I said, have that same yeah, issue. no, that's great. I mean, setting realistic expectations. And so with that is, I'm assuming you don't come out of the gate and suggest that someone starts with a 24 hour fast. No, is, no. <laughs> so what would a reasonable, and I mean, this might be a good time to talk about your 28 day fast start day, day by day, day by yeah. day book or, or, or protocol. Like what's a logical starting point for someone that they're listening. They're like, Hey, this sounds like this might be a good approach for me to implement to over the long term drive some fat loss, but also improve my health through the process, yeah. help me control more calories, help me maybe develop a healthier relationship with food. Um, you know, so where do we go? Well, that is a great question. And another reason people will will quit or, or not have success is because they start too too hot and heavy, like you totally. just said. They're like, I'm gonna do. 19.5 starting on day one, and or I'm going to do a you know 24 hour fast. And no, we don't want to start off from day one. You want to, we don't want to burn ourselves out. I like to think of it as couch to 5K, right? If someone wants to run a 5K, you don't get off the couch and run a 5K. You have to build up to it. And fasting is the same way. We want to build our fasting muscle, if you will. And so in 28 day fast start day by day, which is my new book, which walks people through a 28 day fast start. You choose a plan. You decide, you know, am I someone who's going to rip off the Band-Aid? Even if you're going to rip off the Band-Aid, you're not going to start, you know, too ambitiously. You're going to still ease in week by week till maybe by the, by week four, maybe you're doing a 19.5, maybe. Or you might be someone who's on the opposite end of the spectrum and you need to really ease in. And so you're not going to start, you're actually going to start by, you know, maybe you start day the first week, you're not even going to really fast much. You're going to have a low carb breakfast, low carb lunch, regular dinner. Now, spoiler alert, this is not a low carb diet program, but if someone is really easing in, you know, start, we're trying to, to become fat adapted with Yeah, fasting. there's some metabolic benefits, blood that sugar, metabolic flexibility. Benefits. So you're just you know, the the only reason we have the lower carb ease in meals, if you're choosing to really slowly ease in, would just be because it might help you become fat adapted. 
So then like week two, you drop the breakfast. Now you're having a low carb lunch, regular dinner. And then eventually, you know, my plan, I'm not telling people to eat low carb. I'm not someone who loses weight um, well with carb restriction. Like I did keto, low carb, I never lost any weight at all with that. But it does, it does help you become fat adapted. So um, that would be someone who really wants to ease in. Someone in the middle, you might just start with, you know, like a 16, eight, and then you just maybe next week is 17, seven, yeah. and you're really easing your way in. And um, you're letting your body have time to adapt. And you're recognizing that for that first 28 days, it's not going to feel easy. You're learning how to do something new. You might be hangry, but when you understand that your body's going to adapt and it's going to get better and you're going to feel better. And once your body flips that metabolic switch, it's going to be like, you're not even mm. going to believe it. You're People are all the time like, wow, you said it would happen and I didn't believe you. And here I am. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think um, in my experience, it's really just about the learning process yeah. and the observation process of, you know, you mentioned the term biochemical individuality. Bioindividuality. Right? And, yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's where it's about you doing you and you observing the process and saying, hey, I mean, maybe I'm someone who just needs to start with 12 hours and just exactly. 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and like yep. just rock that for a week and then maybe start to push it up mm -hmm. from there so that we don't go too crazy right out of the gate, which all the diets do. And that's part of the reason why we quote unquote fail or can't right. um, be successful with any one thing is because again, we're being unrealistic about it. And so it gives you the opportunity to just implement this practice of slowly and progressively adding on, observing, seeing how you feel. And especially if you're someone who is more uh, dependent on carbohydrate or, or sugars as a fuel source, you've been eating consistently and perhaps not great food sources, then you might not feel as great, in which case you might need to go a little bit more low carb or you might yep. need to just slow the process. Because part of that adjustment period is we're trying to get our levels of glycogen down in our liver. You know, because to really flip that metabolic switch, you have to have a depleted amount of liver glycogen mm -hmm. before your body needs to flip that metabolic switch. Because it's always going to use the easy to get to fuel first. Sure. That's our body's work. Bo they're pretty smart, right? Um, we're going to use what's available. And so you know, really easing in like that and like you're putting fewer <laughs> carbs in to be sure. stored as liver glycogen can help you in the beginning. So again, like so, I said, I'm not a low carb proponent. I eat lots and lots of carbs and I feel great that way, but you just have to really understand physiologically why you might want to do that at the beginning. Cause, and then eventually, you know, you're, you're shortening that eating window as time goes on. And obviously the amount of time that you're eating is lower. So you're not putting as, you know, as much yeah. fuel in. <laughs> Um, to be stored. Hey friends, quick pause in this episode for an exciting announcement. I'm thrilled to let you know that we've officially partnered with Fullscript to create our own very high-end quality supplement store. Fullscript is the number one online dispensary for professional grade supplements. Now, as you probably have realized, the internet is the Wild West when it comes to supplements, and it's tough to find many of the best products from a reliable source and at an affordable price. I've heard many stories of people ordering something off Amazon and receive something completely different in the bottle, which can actually be quite dangerous when it comes to nutritional supplements. And so in the BSL Nutrition Full Script Dispensary, we've hand-selected a few dozen of our personal favorites and we've broken them into easily searchable categories, including Ben's favorites. Now, the best part of this situation is that due to the buying power of groups, we're able to get you a 15% off retail pricing on the entire catalog of professional products in our shop. These are brands like Designs for Health, Biotics, Research, Biobotanical Research, Microbiome Labs, Seeking Health, and more. So just click on the Join BSL Nutrition Supplement Shop in the show notes to create your free account and place your first order. Orders over $50 receive free shipping on top of our 15% discount on everything. And just so you know, the criteria we use to determine what went into the shop is 
Is the product something we would recommend and or take ourselves and give to our kids? Is the product of the highest quality? And can we provide a lower cost than is available anywhere else on the web? Now, we sincerely hope this helps you save money and acquire the highest quality products for you and your family. And let's get back to the show. Okay, so we're implementing fasting windows. Now, right. I would love for you to dive into two things. One is the frequency of the fasting periods. Is it something that you're doing every single day? Do you, are you undulating the periods? You know, some periods during the week, some different time feedings on the weekend, or, or at least what have your observations been for, for the vast majority of people who are able to sustain this eating lifestyle? But second to that, as you mentioned the term clean fasting or yeah. fasting clean or something like that, um, I think you said. So I'd love for you to explain what that means. Okay. Well, first let's talk about, you know, do you do it every day? Yes. <laughs> You might have a longer eating window one day. You wake up, it's Christmas day. What you tell yourself in your mind makes a big difference. If you say, well, I'm just not going to fast today at all. I'm having a cheat day. You're like, I don't like that terminology, cheat day. You right. know, I might open my eating window first thing in the morning on Christmas day because I've made cheese and sausage balls and they're delicious and we're going to have them first thing in the morning. And, you know, I'm not going to ever tell myself I'm not fasting today. When you're sleeping... You're fasting. So you wake up every morning. There you are. You had a fast. That's why we call it breakfast, break right. fast. Most of us just break our fast later in the day when we're intermittent fasters. So it is a very flexible lifestyle. You know, you don't have to be super duper regimented where like every day it's 20 hours of fasting and four hours of eating. And we really don't even want to be that regimented because, you know, you talked about homeostasis. If you like have a tiny little eating window every day, your body is more likely to adapt to that. Mm. So we do want to have some flexibility. That being said, you know, it's really, really, I guess, common for people to get into a um, kind of a pattern where they're, you know, maybe a little stricter during the week and then weekends, they they have more of like a, I'm being very flexible on the weekend sure. and it might feel great and be a great lifestyle, but they can have such flexible weekends that they're not actually going to lose weight. Like you sure. can, during the week, you're you're keeping your windows a little shorter than on the weekends, it's really, really long. And so you end up just, you know, cruising along and maintaining your weight. So I have a um, one of my 28 day fast start day by day. Each day is a different lesson um, for you, just what, what you need when you need it. And one of them is called Saturday is not a special occasion. It happens every week. And I really had to, figure that out for myself when I was in the weight loss part of my journey. I'm not there anymore. I'm I'm not trying to lose weight. I'm maintaining. So I can be more flexible whenever I want to be. Because I also understand, oop, I've had a little window creep. My windows have gotten a little longer. My honesty pants are a little tight. I need to kind of dial it back a little bit. In maintenance, you learn how to that that ebb and flow a mm -hmm. little bit. But when you're actively in the in the trying to lose weight period, you need to be consistent. So the key word is flexible, but also consistent. So you can't like take weekends off. And, well, the and... laws of thermodynamics still <laughs> apply here. Calories well, still know, matter. So let's we, not. We do. You know, I, I talk about in Fast Feast Repeat in the feast section that, you know, even though we don't count calories, that doesn't mean calories don't count. Even though calories are a flawed unit of measurement. Sure. You know, because our bodies take calories in differently, it can be the same number of calories on a label. But like if we're eating almonds versus if we're eating Twinkies, your body, yeah, those Twinkies are like pre-digested. Your body can use all 100 calories instantly. But with the nuts, your body has to do a lot of work on those. Yeah, so, fiber and yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So you're not going to, you're not going to use all 100 calories. You're going to, body's going to burn a lot of those up. But anyway, and some of it's fiber, but. You really do have to keep in mind that if you do not ever, you know, have that consistent time to get into the fat burning state, you can you're not gonna you're not gonna lose weight. And on the weekend, if you're eating so much that you know you're undoing what you did over the week, you're also not gonna lose weight. So it's just you know it's about finding that balance with So with, okay. So you mentioned almonds and Twinkies, and then yeah. you you know, we had discussed this this term fasting clean. Is that what you right. said? And I haven't talked about fasting clean yet, but yeah. Well, you mentioned it, and so I want to jump into it is like what does that mean and and 
Yeah. I mean, what does that mean? Right. Well, when we're talking about fast and clean, you know, we've got our fasting time, we've got our eating time. Most people understand the concept of eating clean. That's your eating window. You know, if you're in your eating window, you're going to have better results if you eat Almonds and not Twinkies. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. Almonds are going to be better for weight loss than Twinkies. We all know this. And, um, you know, sometimes intermittent fasting is sold as eat whatever you want. You know, I actually have a whole section on this. What does it mean to eat whatever you want? It's not the same as eat whatever you want. That's not not going to be a good weight loss strategy. But when we're talking about fasting clean, that is literally the fasting time. And so fasting clean has to do with what you're consuming or putting into your mouth during the fasting time. And that makes a huge difference. And I talk about this in my book, Fast, Feast, Repeat. And I also talk about it in my new book, 28 Day Fast Start Day by Day, because you got to understand the clean fast. And so when we, when we, when I was learning how to fast and reading about it and learning about it, you know, trial and error along the way, we didn't know what we were doing in the early days. You know, I was drinking my diet sodas, putting cinnamon in my coffee and stevia in my coffee and maybe having a little bone broth, whatever. And I thought I was fasting. Once I read the obesity code and really started learning about insulin and how our bodies work, then I realized, hmm, if we're going to actually fast, we need to make sure that we're, we're doing certain things. And so when I wrote Fast, Feast, Repeat, I said, well, how can I explain this so people will really get it? And so I came up with the three fasting goals. And when you understand the three fasting goals, you can understand why it's important to fast clean. So that first fasting goal is keeping our insulin low. Mm -hmm. now, I talked about that before. Insulin is a storage hormone. And if your insulin is really, really high all the time, you're going to have a hard time tapping into your fat stores. And so we got to get our insulin down. And fasting is the best way to do that because we're not having to pump out insulin to deal with food. You know, what seems logical to me is like, listen, if we're fasting, we're, we're not consuming calories. Now, what I thought of when you were saying fasting clean is all of the permutations of fasting that people have in their mind is like, well, I can still do my bulletproof coffee right. and I can still have my supplement, you know, drinks. And I feel like based on ex exactly what you're explaining is like the intention of the fast is to leverage the body's response to zero calorie load. Yes. Um, and, and therefore let's not introduce calories in any forms as like right. your your high fat bulletproof coffee is by definition going to take you out of fasting. That's fasting goal two. <laughs> so okay. fasting goal one, keep your insulin low. So we want to avoid anything that makes our brain think food is coming in. That would be your herbal teas that are fruity, putting lemon in your water, apple cider vinegar, all the flavor things, flavor that that's coming in. So we we don't want to have any of that. Fasting goal two is we want to tap into our stored fat for fuel. And or use the fuel that's in our liver. We want to use fuel that's already on hand. And if you're taking in other sources of fuel, bulletproof coffee, yeah, butter in your coffee, exogenous ketones would be a, another, you know, fuel source, Any if you will. Source. Yeah. And anything like that. So we we don't want to take in another source of fuel while we're fasting. We want to use our liver glycogen. We want to use our stored fat for fuel. So you don't you don't want to take any more fuel in. And then our third fasting goal is we would like to have increased autophagy. And autophagy really, we, we, we suddenly started hearing about it in 2016. The Nobel Prize in Medicine came out based on autophagy research. And you know, lots of things upregulate autophagy, but one of those things is fasting. Right. And you know, autophagy is our body's cellular housekeeping system. It can recycle old junky proteins that are on hand. And so what would downregulate autophagy? Well, eating protein, for example, protein, you, you don't need to have recycling going on if you're taking it in. So that's why you would avoid bone broth and things like that. But it's yeah. also food. Really just a simple way of thinking about the clean fast is if you were going to have, you know, fasted blood work or going to have surgery, you wouldn't be sipping your bulletproof coffee before. Yeah, totally. No, it you makes a lot of sense. I think we rationalize things a lot of ways. Like, well, I'm yeah. still fasting, but I'm drinking my coffee with cream. It's yeah. like, oh, but I, you know, it's like just a little bit of calories, but yeah, dude, you're, you're not fasting anymore. Well, it's going to um, make you so much hungrier. And so, you know, we, we can have black coffee, a bitter, bitter flavor profile does not cause an insulin response. We can have plain tea, regular, like real tea, black tea, green tea, like tea, like 
The tea yeah. aisle is mostly not real tea. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, can have yeah. plain water. You can have plain sparkling water, but we want to avoid the flavors. I challenge anybody who thinks that, that well, the, the Bulletproof coffee works for me or the diet sodas work for me. I would like for you to give it 30 days. Take the clean fast challenge. That's it. Just try it for yourself. Fast clean for 30 days with black coffee, plain tea, plain water, plain sparkling water, nothing else. See what happens. See how you feel. And then you can try those things and see. You yeah. Know, test them and see. You're not going to go back. What we don't have is people saying, I tried the clean fast challenge for 30 days. Then I added back the cream and cream works great. For we don't usually have people do that. We usually have people who say, I didn't think you were right. I Because I've been adding a little bit of cream in my coffee the whole time. And I thought it was fine. I thought it worked for me. And then I put it out for 30 days, didn't have it. And you are right. Wow, that made a we'll difference. Will definitely make a difference. I yeah. and and I, I'm in agreement. And just in terms of like, listen, it's just give yourself the best opportunity to be successful mm -hmm. with this. If we're going to go down the road of truly observing our body's response to this fasting, you know, mechanism, then why not, you know, tr truly be fasting, truly be calorie free, and you know, if you feel like yep. you need all of those sweet things, I think that in and of itself lends itself to probably this overt level of of poor blood sugar regulation to the degree that you need these artificial hits. Yeah. So that's been my observation and, and experience with that. And, and so who is intermittent fasting not for, or who in particular does not do well with intermittent fasting? Well, you should not do intermittent fasting if you are a child or still growing. Teenagers should not do it. So do not Except for my kids that don't eat breakfast. That well, that, that's not different because they're, they're listening to their bodies. That's really, really different. You, I completely believe that we should not force our kids to get up they're and eat breakfast stubborn. if they naturally don't want to. But don't put your 12-year-olds like, all right, honey, you're doing intermittent fasting. No. So we do not want to put our kids on an intermittent fasting regimen. We want them to learn to listen to their bodies. Also, intermittent fasting is not right for you if you're pregnant. It's not right for you if you're breastfeeding. And if you are somebody who um, has struggled with an eating disorder, then you should work with Fair your enough. counselor. You, yeah. know, you should not go it alone. You know, intermittent fasting is not an eating disorder. It does not cause an eating disorder, but it is a tool that people with eating disorders have misused. Just like that laxatives, for example. Laxatives are not an eating disorder. There might be time for laxatives, but people could misuse them. So you don't want to do intermittent fasting without guidance from a professional if you're in that situation. One of the things we, we hear more and more lately is you know, women have to be super careful. And I actually don't think that women have to be extra careful when it comes to intermittent fasting, other than working with your biology the way we always should have been to start with. What is bad for women is over-restriction. And you know, like over dieting, doing too much for your body. We've done that though for for a long time. Like I can remember back in the day doing some of those crazy diets that were definitely very low calorie, super restrictive. Those were not good for my body. Intermittent fasting though is not an overly restrictive way to live because we're fasting, we're feasting, we're repeating, we're nourishing our bodies well. So when we when we do intermittent fasting as a woman and we are nourishing our bodies well, it is not the same as doing one of those highly restrictive low calorie diets. And, you know, we hear a lot of things from women who like, well, they will have, maybe they had PCOS and they had struggled with having a regular cycle for years. And then they start intermittent fasting and then suddenly their cycle is regular again. And, and it gets, it's like gotten them back into hormonal balance. So yeah. Women should not be overly restricting, even in an intermittent fasting paradigm, but that doesn't mean intermittent fasting is overly restrictive. Absolutely. And I appreciate um, that context. You know, mm -hmm. that's where, you know, you said making sure that you're nourishing your body. And I yes. think that if we're not careful about it, it can be a slippery slope, especially for the type A person who's like, more is better. Right. And because I can do this means I should do this. Now, right. let's dive in just briefly. And, and I want to respect your time. So we'll wrap it up after that. But let's speak to nourishing your body. One of the things that we know very clearly, especially as we age, 
is the importance of lean muscle tissue. We know the importance of getting enough protein in our diet. You know, speaking of nutrition, speaking of macronutrients and with nourishing, we need enough macronutrients. We need enough micronutrients and vitamins and minerals. And, you know, one of the things I would imagine and have seen is that when eating windows are too small, it becomes more challenging. Yes, we can absolutely more effectively manage calories, which is great for weight loss, but we can't think about weight loss in perpetuity. You said maintenance, you said you're in a phase where, you know, and you're enjoying plenty of carbs, which is beautiful. So what are some of the tools that you use with your audience to ensure that they are in fact getting a big enough eating window, eating enough of the right nutrients, getting enough protein and, um, well, we won't talk about exercise yet, but just, just with those. (laughs) Here's the thing that I really want people to think about. Go back in time, like before the modern era, when we understood calories and macros and all of that, or even go to places right now, like, you know, the blue zones, you know, where people are just eat, they just eat. People, people just ate and they knew how to eat. You know, like, like I think about my, I'm, I have two adult sons, but when they were babies, they knew when they'd had enough and they knew when they were still hungry. So we have a body that will tell us what we need to eat. Like I'd have just gone through a period of time the past week where I've been craving eggs like crazy. Why? I don't know. My body needed something from those eggs. Choline, B vitamins. Something, something in those eggs. My body needed it. So I've been eating eggs like crazy and I don't question it. But when you are an intermittent faster and you're feeding your body mostly real food, um, you know, where I have my, another book that I wrote is called Clean Ish eat mostly clean, live mainly clean. Um, When we're feeding our bodies mostly real food, we can reconnect with our hunger and satiety signals Mm -hmm. in a whole new way. You know, instead of reaching for the junk food, you're like, oh, I need some Brussels sprouts today, or gosh, I'm craving the eggs. And, you know, people will start intermittent fasting and maybe they've been eating the standard American diet and they're overfed and undernourished. But as they get farther along, they're like, you know, I was craving a salad today. Mm -hmm. And so we don't find that people struggle with, you know, how much to eat or what to eat or counting things once they learn to listen. You know, like last night I had a big burger. I was also craving some meat for whatever reason, you know, and I don't always eat meat every single day, but my body's like, have that big burger. And so I think that our body is looking for nutrients. And if we're putting the nutrients in, our body's like, all right, that was what we needed. And if not, it'll your body will send you the signal to eat more. So like anyone who's ever had like a junk food day where you're just eating junk, right? We've all probably had a day like that in our lives, whether we want to admit it or not. You're not satisfied. You could be at the end of that day, you might feel like crap because you've eaten nothing but junk all day and you're stuffed and you feel miserable but you still don't feel satisfied. You've not put any nutrients in for your body. Versus if you have a really nutrient-dense meal, you're full, you're satisfied, you go, oh, I've had enough. You know, I really believe our bodies are wise. I don't count anything. I don't count calories. I don't count macros. I don't count my protein. You know, I'm able to build muscle. I I exercise. Building muscle is very, very important, especially as we age. I'm 54. I want to age and be strong. Yeah. But my body lets me know when it needs a little something else. And you've been doing this a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so we're on the spectrum of, of where most people are getting started. There's mm-hmm. very little you know, aspect of intuitiveness to what they right. really need, coupled with the fact that all of our foods are engineered to trigger our brain for excitement. And so you were dead on and I can relate with you absolutely. And we see this time after time after time with our clients whose palates start to change, their gut health starts to change. Yeah. They start to prefer eating more wholes, as we yeah. call it, single ingredient foods. We can, quote unquote, intuitively move them away mm-hmm. from the data collection process and into how they're actually feeling, what they truly want. But it's really about that long-term progression Mm -hmm. that it sounds like, you know, um, intermittent fasting is a great way to put some guardrails in place, first and foremost, help us develop that level of metabolic flexibility to get us, you know, 
potentially burning more body fat again, a healthy, you know, more of a healthy metabolism and more metabolic flexibility. I'm getting us relying less on the sugar spikes um, mm -hmm. and processed foods. And, you know, the other thing that I think lends itself to this idea of, of, of being able to eat, you know, what you feel is appropriate is the one thing that's missing is that, um, especially in the blue zones, is people move their bodies a lot. Yes, they do. They do. And I was with someone the other day and bless her heart. She's like, well, we're going to be retiring soon. And so we bought a house so we wouldn't have to climb stairs. And I'm like, no, no, right. you need to buy a house with three stories and climb exactly. them all the time. And, you know, instead of assuming that as we get older, we need to be more like stay in our little bottom floor, you know, the blue zones, they are climbing like the hills of you know exactly. Italy that, naturally. And so you know, like I'm sitting here in my work condo and it's on the third floor and we don't have an elevator. And I run up and down those stairs and it's great. When I get up yep. here, I jump on my little mini trampoline. I mean, we've got to stay active as we as we age. And, you know, the thing about muscle, you know this, uh, but for some reason, the people just in general don't understand it. They think if I eat protein, I will build muscle. Just like, I guess, randomly. Jason Fung has a hilarious blog post. Have you read his work? Have you read? I, no, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but he I have He wrote haven't. a blog post about protein, which is really funny. And he said that if eating more protein automatically just caused you to build muscle, then we would have a muscle epidemic. <laughs> and we don't because you have to work your muscle to build your muscle, right? Yeah, that's right. If you eat, if you're not working your muscle, you're not going to build muscle. So we have to, yes, provide the building blocks about the food that we're taking in, but then we also have to use our muscles to build them. So just, you know, eating a lot of protein and sitting on the couch, you're not going right. to, you're not going to have and, build, build, build muscles. And you need to move your body to yes. facilitate this metabolic flexibility that it's we're true. talking about. It's not just going to happen right. from you regulating your calories and switching, you know, between your feeding and fasting windows is movement is, you know, a lot of the electrical signals that facilitate these pathways uh, and the lubricant to, to get everything going and to manage blood sugar and improve digestion and anxiety and cognitive function. And the list goes on and on and on. And you agree with me. And that's also one of the things that we see in the blue zones to say mm -hmm. nothing of community. Um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you've got an amazing community. Um, so with that said, share with us, you know, where people can find out more about you, how they can join your community, um, and what have you, Jen. All right. Well, if you go to jenstevens.com and Jen is like gin and tonic and Stevens is with a PH, jenstevens.com, everything is linked there. So I'm super excited about my new book coming out 28 day fast start day by day, because my my original book, Fast, Feast, Repeat, is very, very comprehensive. It's so comprehensive. And it's got, you know, a little 28-day fast start chapter, but it's so comprehensive that people like get stuck. There's mm. too much in there. So I realized that we needed something a little bit just kind of help people through that first 28 days. So that's why I wrote 28-day fast start day by day. It's available for pre-order now. It comes out December 26th. So everybody listening, you're going to want to pre-order a copy of 28 day Beautiful. fast start day by day. And it will literally walk you through how to get started every day. You get like a little bit of what you need for that day as far as your lesson. And you it's reflective. So you're like, you know, planning what you're going to do. You're checking some things off. There's a little journaling component in there, not like anything that's going to take a long time, but just enough to really get you in that mindset of checking in with your day and understanding what you're doing. And then I also have a community and at jenstevens.com, there's a link to that community. We're actually going to be, um, I'm really excited about this starting January 4th, because I figured out, all right, the book comes out December 26th and, you know, when is a great time for us to actually have our first, you know, as a community, 28 days, January 4th through 31st will be our 28 day fast start. You know, you could have started on January 1st, but <laughs> no one starts on January. Nobody that's wants a, to start on January. That's a drinking first. day. Let's be honest. Uh, it's still a drinking gonna day. Everybody's going to roll Yeah. So by the time most people, most people, new year, new you, January 4th, you're really yeah. ready. 
what's that? There's like a meme about, you know, like you're full of cheese by that point. I don't even know, but you're ready. By January 4th, you're like, I am ready. So we're going to actually have in our community a 28 day fast start group for people who are starting out and um, using the 28 day fast start day by day. But the community, you can join that jenstevens.com slash community. And it's a really great place. I used to be on Facebook and I left and having this private community, it's re- it's not expensive. It's like $9.99 a month. And you're going to save that just on lattes. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> in a, two days. Um, but you know, I'm there and I comment on everybody's post. So let's do this. Um, I'm going to put all the links in the show notes. Okay. Uh, for those of you listening, the first five people that leave us a positive review in iTunes, I'm going to buy you a copy of Jin's oh, new book, The 28 Day Fasting. Awesome. Um, 28 Day Fast Start Day by Day. Fast Start Day by Day. I'm going to buy you guys yeah. a copy. So the first five people that leave us a review, uh, just shoot me the uh, picture of the review. Uh, my contact info is below in the show notes. And I'd love to be able to support you. I love this conversation, Jen. I love what you're doing. I love the realistic approach of Mm -hmm. helping people make smart nutrition simple, which is what we're all about. So thank you so much for your time, uh, energy, effort, wisdom, knowledge. I appreciate you. And I'm looking forward to uh, reading your book. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. And if you found this content valuable, Here are four ways I can help you in your nutrition journey for free. One, grab a free copy of my Fat Loss Fix Guide at fatlossfixguide.com. Two, join my free group at smartnutritionmadesimple.com. Three, subscribe to my YouTube channel at smartnutritionmadesimpletv.com. Four, leave a five-star rating and positive review so that we can gain access to more nutrition experts ready to share their knowledge with you and ultimately help more people make smart nutrition simple.